Uh, so yeah, we are going to start. This is the third episode of our monthly webinar series conducted by the Students Affairs Division in collaboration with our Media Society of the Faculty of Medicine, University of California. Um, and so today's episode, yeah, so we're going to be talking about an interesting topic, um, relationships for better or for worse. It certainly is an interesting topic, but more so it's an important topic. And it's a topic that, I mean, it affects all of us in general, but we never really talk about it much. And I think we should. Now, as I've mentioned before in a, in a, post, a previous post before, university life opens doors to all forms of relationships, healthy friendships, platonic relationships, or even, I mean, uh, in this uh, context, uh, connections, relationships that would gradually graduate towards becoming intimate, and intimate romantic relationships. Now, uh, if we... Uh, okay, so uh, now if we're being honest, most of us, in fact, uh, regardless of what we think, we don't really have a proper understanding when it comes to relationships. We don't really have... Uh, you know, we have all these questions and concerns. I mean, you know, whether we should get into a relationship, how are we supposed to get into a relationship, even if we wanted to? What things should we consider? Or maybe we are already in a relationship and we might be looking to, I guess, develop it and how maybe making it more healthy and stable. So now all these questions and concerns that we have stems from the fact that we don't have a proper understanding about forming intimate relationships. And to give us this proper understanding, we have an esteemed guest with us. So uh, it is my privilege to introduce her, Dr. Ashwini Diabru. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, allow me to introduce her properly. So Dr. Ashwini Diabru is a lecturer in the Department of Medical Education, Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo. She has an MD in Medical Education from the University of Colombo and an MA in Biomedical Ethics from the University of Leeds. She is the treasurer of the WHO Collaborating Center in Medical Education and the administrator of the Sri Lanka Clinical Trials Registry. Her special interests are curriculum development, technology-based education, and student support. And to top it all off, she has over 12 years of experience in teaching and mentoring undergraduates in medicine and in the allied health professions. So, um, and I know she has a really busy schedule. So, I mean, I thank her, my heart is appreciation for giving us this time to talk with us. So, uh, Doctor, it's my pleasure and honor to welcome you. Dr. Ashwini Diabru, everyone. Uh, good evening, Doctor. Uh, well. Good evening. And uh, thank you very much, Abhishek, for that uh, kind introduction. And my thanks also go out uh, to the Faculty of Medicine, University of Kalania, to the Dean, uh, to the Students of Airs Division, and to uh, Aura Media for inviting me uh, to this session. It is truly a pleasure to be here with you this evening. Um, I'd like to start with a disclaimer. Right? I am coming into this discussion as a lecturer um, for undergraduates in medicine and allied health sciences. And I am drawing on my experience in student support as well as uh, certain um, certain supporting items in the literature. I am not a trained relationship counselor, so my perspective will be uh, that of uh, a medical teacher. And um, because this session, we are focusing on um, the needs, really, and um, the thoughts of medical students. Very well, Dr. Bharat. Paramount importance to us, and uh, so uh, doc, and also I would like to uh, just quick to mention this on that note. Uh, if any of y'all have any sort of uh, question, concern, I'm sure a lot of y'all might have uh, questions, concerns with regards to relationships. I mean, there's no wrong question. It could be a personal question, a general question, whatever it is. Please feel free to drop them in the chat down below, or you could uh, submit it the google form that we've been circulating these past few days and because at the end of this session in the last 15 or 20 minutes we'll have a small uh, q a session where we will hopefully be able to discuss and go through uh, most of your uh, most as much as many as your questions as possible 
All right. So without wasting any time, we'll straight away get into it. Uh, my first question to you, doctor, is um, now despite, you know, what we as students may think that we know about relationships, mm -hmm. we claim to know a lot. Um, and yet the truth is, I mean, if we're being honest, uh, most of us don't really have a lot of experience in mm -hmm. relationships. And a lot of us lack that a good knowledge about intimate relationships and uh, you know, how to get into one or maybe, you know, you know, because, I mean, we have, students have formed these misconceptions rather and mm -hmm. all these warped preconceived notions as to what a relationship means. Some students have uh, concerned about their age and they feel like they want to rush into relationships. Mm -hmm. So they're in that mentality. Mm -hmm. uh, the opposite end of the spectrum, you have students who are not at all interested in forming mm -hmm. relationships and they're cool with that. So doctor, to clarify everything up, clear everything up, um, can you please like introduce us to our students what mm -hmm. an intimate relationship really means and what it means to be in one? Okay, uh, thank you. And it's really great to start with an introduction and a definition, right? So that sort of sets the stage for this discussion. Um, so intimate relationships are ones that where there is physical and emotional intimacy. In other words, there is closeness, there is connection. Now, this could even mean family, but the term is used, the general use of the term is to refer to romantic relationships, right? Uh, in clinical terminology, we use the term intimate partner relationships because that term is um, very general and it encompasses or includes married and unmarried relationships, uh, casual or serious relationships, as well as heterosexual uh, versus same sex versus non-binary relationships. So I think the key words here is that there is closeness and this closeness is felt by both parties in the relationship. You also asked what it means to be in one, right? So the meaning comes from that closeness, from that connectivity. And when we seek intimate relationships, it is because of the need to connect with someone, a need to be close to someone, to be cared for, and to experience physical and mental affection. So where does this need come from? Right? There are biological factors as well as social factors, right? Uh, as you know, uh, many, many things in life are multifactorial. So biologically, from a reproductive point of view, right? And socioculturally, because as soon as someone becomes a young adult, right, there is a lot of scrutiny from society to be in a relationship. And usually, especially in our society, uh, it is a relationship that leads to marriage and children and ultimately having a family of their own. The thing is, we tend to internalize this belief and this scrutiny, right? And many young adults think that they must be in a relationship by a certain time or a certain age. Now, this is not uh, exclusive to Sri Lanka. We see it in many cultures. Uh, in Eastern cultures, they have... Um, uh, a term called uh, Chinese New Year noodles or New Year noodles, right? So New Year is the 30th or the 31st of the month. So by the time someone reaches 30 or 31 years, they are considered well old noodles, not, not worth eating. Um, sometimes uh, this is referred to as someone being a Christmas cake, right? So after the age of 25, after the 25th of December, um, you know, I, it's old goods or stale goods because of this socially imposed um, timeline, right? So I'd like to throw a question to the audience and you can um, use uh, the react button uh, on Zoom to raise your hands, right? Have you either thought by yourself or has someone ever told you that you should be in a relationship or you should be married by a certain age. 
So could you raise your hands, please? So I get um, an idea of what you have gone through. Right. Okay. So if you have either felt it yourself or had someone tell you. Hands raised, I think. Right. So, uh, Abhishek, I can't see the number of hands. So, if you could let me know. Uh, yeah. Uh, wait, the number is increasing. Uh, okay. uh, Around yeah, 20, more than 20, actually. Okay. So, more than so 20. yes. And uh, some may still be getting into it. And I'm, I'm sure if I had asked the question, um, maybe worded it, whether it was you or anyone you knew, right? Make it a little broader. I think we would have had uh, okay. more uh, uh, people who fall into that group. Now, why do we feel like this? Why, why are these conventions there? Right. So when, when you look at things, people have these beliefs for various reasons. One reason is dogma. They think, OK, if you do not do it in a certain way, uh, something terrible will happen. The sky will fall on your head. You will be shunned by society. You will uh, not be able to um, have children uh, or something like that. Right. The next, another reason is, is tradition. We have always done it this way, and therefore we will continue to do it this way, right? Uh, a third reason people say is convention. Others do it, right? So, um, you know, uh, other people in the community uh, or different communities, they are practicing it in such a way. Why can't you do it? But really the most important thing to consider when it comes to an intimate relationship, remember the word is intimate. It is what works for you, right? I hope uh, I have addressed your question here. Yeah, doctor, it's, it's all about connecting and then that the primal need to connect here has to be highlighted and mm -hmm. intimate. I mean, we don't just say intimate for nothing. So that, that has to be, be, the spotlight has to be on that word. And so everything must develop, you know, branching out from that. Uh, so thank you, Doctor. Now, um, I believe that was pretty well sufficient. And the next question, Doctor, is, uh, well, well it's, it's the follow-up question. So we introduced the topic. We introduced what you meant. Now, um, students will, I mean, say that a student decides to get into a relationship. Maybe, I mean, again, like you said, so many factors influencing it, but anyways, the student decides to get it. So what things should this student, I mean, take into consideration? What things should he or she not take into consideration if they decide to get into a relationship? Along with that line, uh, the challenges that student might face, obviously, getting into it. Right. Now, um, thank you, Abhishek, and as you mentioned, and as I also uh, highlighted earlier, this session is geared uh, towards medical students, university students, right? And for many of you, this is your first taste of adult life, right? Uh, you are uh, out of, um, you know, your parental household for most of the day. Some of you are living by yourself, either in hostels or, or in boarding houses, right? For the first time, you're living away from home for an extended period for the first time, right? And with this comes a sense of freedom, right? Uh, and this is very natural, the need to explore certain boundaries that were there uh, when, um, when you were a secondary school student, right? And that is natural because you all are adults, okay? So there are many who come to university um, because of their uh, cultural background or social background or because of parental expectations, they have never been involved in an intimate relationship uh, before, right? And again, this is natural because especially for school, uh, for secondary school students, uh, teachers, parents often tell, you know, you need to focus on your studies, 
right? You need to focus on your studies. There will be plenty of time for this later on, right? And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but those who enter medical school and uh, the majority of the participants here are those who have made the best use of their secondary school education, right? So some of you would have been able to balance a relationship as well, but a lot of you come uh, to the university environment um, with either a conscious or unconscious knowledge of trying to push those boundaries or test those boundaries. Uh, once again, a question to the audience, right? Uh, how many of you have experienced or you have seen among your friends where within one or two weeks of acquaintance after coming to the faculty, uh, relationships have formed? Or, uh, you know, there are couple parties, right? Uh, can I see a few hands? If any of you have seen it, you have experienced it yourself or seen it uh, among your friends. Uh, Abhishek, if you can let me know the numbers. Yeah. Ones. Uh, I myself. Mm, yeah, uh, 16, close to 20, close to 20, same sort. Okay, right. So about 25% of this audience has at least noted or observed this happening, right? This is normal, right? It is nothing abnormal. It is nothing uh, to be ashamed about. It is nothing to look down upon because it is a natural consequence of the um, social and cultural context that we each come from, okay? But your question is what to take into consideration um, when forming or entering an intimate relationship, right? So closeness, right? Now, for some, uh, unfortunately, the, the need to for acceptance, the need to feel included as a couple, uh, the social need that plays a part, right? So we will leave that aside for the moment, right? And we think about a person who is now consciously considering right, whether they are really, uh, ready for an intimate relationship, right? So self-awareness is very important. And you need to actually sit down and think, what do I expect from a relationship? And those of you who are already in a relationship, it is not too late to think this, right? Um, because it, it is important to know yourself first before you look for something you can get from another person, right? So it could be... Um, since we use the word intimacy, it could be the physical intimacy. It could be the feeling of being understood by someone, being accepted for who you are, for your traits, right? So the topic today is for better or for worse, right? So none of us are perfect, but someone who accepts you for who you are, right? Uh, it, there could be other um, sort of peripheral things um, so that you have company, companionship, someone to sit next to, right? Uh, someone to have your lunch with. Um, it could be uh, the sort of shared learning that takes place in a university environment, right? And uh, in for some couples, right, this peer learning becomes very successful where they tend to encourage and motivate each other to uh, reach higher goals. So your needs and how important they are, right, should be considered. Now, there are other needs that come in. Now, for, for example, some of us think, and some students think, and some young adults think, that uh, when I get into a relationship, it has to be with marriage in mind, right? It is a permanent relationship, and I am going into it heart and soul so that it will work. This is my happily ever after, right? 
some of them get into a relationship thinking that look i haven't had a chance to explore um this um my attraction to others and let me explore this right and this is not exclusive to males or exclusive to females it, it just depends on personality types and really what what they're looking for okay um so that you need to be aware of that and that should also um so when you take into consideration the facts you factors rather take into consideration you have to also factor in the other person right so rather than and i'm sure uh, you would you can think of at least one or two instances uh, especially uh, those of us who are teaching faculty where a relationship has been entered into within a very short time without knowing the other person right what sort of person they are what their likes and dislikes are what their prejudices are and so on so nobody is perfect we all have our personality traits we all have our flaws so what you need to consider is can i live with this person is this or can i associate with this person and their flaws right are they flaws i can accept and live with and vice versa right um for example uh some someone might uh be very particular uh about let's say uh, their partner's dress the attire right so the partner needs to think is this something that i am okay to live with and as well as how this can change over time right so um i think those are the important things if i am to summarize to um identify what you need from a relationship right um as well as what is needed by your partner to identify to think about to consider the flaws uh, you may have both parties and whether these are flaws you can tolerate during the course of the relationship um yeah doctor that was i am pretty sure that uh, response resonated with so many uh and you know cuz it's basically the spotlight has to be on yourself we are all flawed and properly trying to analyze yourself before getting carried away getting into something and then the spotlight on that other person trying to see and basically trying to see if you know if analysis has to be there in this i guess you know cuz there's really no uh there's need really no what you call it there's no timer that's ticking there's no clock that's ticking you know there's there's, there's no one pointing a gun there's no threat anywhere so you know, that has, the time has to be given cuz we're talking about people get being being with another person for the rest of your life yes. that's an important decision and and pay doctor you want so um uh, may i add or uh, may i clarify that this is this thought or this process of thinking does not need to happen in a single isolated point of time it is an ongoing process right because it takes time to to learn about yourself as well as to learn about others so sometimes when you are in the university environment you may learn things about yourself that you did not know that you were not aware of when you were in secondary school likewise it may take time to learn about uh, your partner or prospective partner right so this is something that you need to consciously consciously be aware of and and consider right during this this whole process very true, very true. uh so uh moving on to the next question and this again i mean it it follows up with this but uh, the focus now a lot was attention was paid on basically trying to get into it if you're initiating a relationship but um we know and of course that students are already there who have you know established relationships and you know whether or not i mean again exploring each other time goes on yeah that's there but 
for the time being, established, more or less established relationships. Um, in the context of medical students, when we consider your medical students, uh, what sort of challenges would such established couples, I would rather say, or, you know, mm -hmm. would, would they face challenges and concerns that they should have, uh, or issues that they may arise, mistakes that they might make? Okay, so um, relationships are very complex, right? And what works for one person may not work for another, or what works for one couple may not work for another, right? But there are certain common themes that run throughout the spectrum of different types of relationships. They ring alarm bells, right? There are red flags, what we call red flags. These are danger signs, right? Um, one of the biggest right, things that I see, that I see very often, and I'm sure uh, the teaching faculty uh, who are with us today would also have seen this, uh, is this disregard for boundaries, right? The lack of healthy boundaries. So, um, Many of us are influenced by the romance books and novels we have read by Disney movies and uh, Bollywood movies where you and I, we are one, we are one person, one soul. Um, and this means that your boundaries as a person tend to get blurred, right? Now, for example, privacy is something that is very important for any person, right? Um, but I see in relationships that uh, giving up this privacy uh, is seen as a measure of trust, where one party says, oh, you know, I even shared my passwords with such and such a person and with my partner. And, and, and as, a, um, as a measure of trust, or they will say, I share my passwords. They don't, right? Uh, why don't they want to share the passwords, right? Or it would be that, you know, my partner always checks my phone. My partner wants me to put live location, right? Uh, my partner has installed a tracking app on my phone. And it has gotten, and this is a true story, uh, it has gotten uh, obsessive to a point, right, where uh, the partner would measure or time the distance from faculty to the to home by bus, and then the walk from the bus stop to the home. And if it is twenty five minutes, and if uh, the other partner does not call in twenty five minutes and say I am home, right, it becomes a big trust issue, right. So boundaries are very important. That is what, is, what is your personal space and how much you wish to share that with another person. That should come voluntarily from you, right? It should not be um, forced upon you in order to sustain the relationship, right? So that, that's a big red flag, right? Then um, what we call manipulation, emotional manipulation. And this comes with withholding of affection, right? So suddenly calls are not answered, uh, texts are not replied to, um, and you know the messages are seen, but there is no response, they are online. So you can see that there is a bit of monitoring from the other party as well, right? They are online, but they haven't replied to me. And this, it's very painful when someone withholds affection from you, right? And when someone does it to punish you or manipulate you to a certain course of action, right? That becomes toxic, right? It, it damages the relationship. So they will say, well, if you, okay, fine, you can stay, um, stay for this activity. And they will say it grudgingly, but then they will not talk to you for the next five days. 
right? And the other party will okay, participate, let's say, in a faculty activity, right? But uh, then have to suffer for five days as a sort of punishment, right? So manipulation and disregard of boundaries, right? Then empathy or lack of empathy is, um, is a big red flag, right? So now we talked about closeness, we talked about connectivity. Right? So when a relationship is entered into for peripheral reasons, for social acceptance, or because uh, marriage is a target, and at some point you realize that you are not really compatible, but you're still in this relationship, and if you terminate the relationship, there may be other consequences. What will people say? How will I look? Will I look like uh, a player? Will I look like uh, someone who is fast, right? So we, within that context, sometimes there is, the, the closeness breaks down. There is no empathy. There is no understanding, right? And there's no caring. It, it just goes on. Um, the way um, you know very passively with no act, no active involvement no, yeah. yes no no joy in that relationship right um so uh again a red flag and the control this is part of it is i mean it's linked with the lack of boundaries or disregard for boundaries some partners in relationships are excessively controlling, right? Whether it is attire, right? Attire is controlled or behavior who you talk to, right? Don't talk to other males, don't talk to other females or why did you talk to other males or other females? Um, who was, your phone was engaged? Why are you, or why are you online? How do I know? So there have been times where Again, these are student uh, relationships where the other party has said, share your screen with me so that I know you are online for an academic activity and not for anything else, right? And you're not chatting with someone else, right? So um, that, that type of control, again, like I said, can be very, very damaging to the relationship. And why? Because what happens is the party that is on the receiving end tries to rationalize this. Maybe I deserve it. Maybe it's because I didn't do a certain thing properly. Maybe, so now we come to a slippery slope. Maybe I am useless. It's because I'm useless. It's because I'm worthless, right? Maybe, nobody else will want me, right? So these can be very, very toxic, lead to a sort of toxic spiral, okay? I can go on and on about red flags, you know, sometimes uh, when I see a relationship, there, there are more red flags than you see in a parade, okay? Uh, but I want to take a few more minutes, two, three minutes, and talk about green flags, because we talk a lot about red flags, right? how to identify when someone is toxic or, or probably not relationship material or how to identify when your relationship is becoming problematic. But green flags are very important as well because now green flags, that those sort of behaviors are ones that support the closeness, the connectivity and the joy that comes with in with being a part of an intimate relationship, right? So one thing is when that other party supports your growth, your personal growth, they encourage you, they motivate you, right? Uh, they will support you um, with certain choices. Sometimes they may not even agree with your choices, right? Or they may not even think it is important but they will still support you because that is important to you. I think that is a wonderful green flag to look out for, right? Uh, and 
another thing, um, another green flag is that they have good long-term friendships with others, right? They have good friends. They have long-term friends, right? Which shows you that they are capable of, um, of certain uh, behaviors and uh, they have certain characteristics that are valued by others, right? Um, things like self-responsibility, self-sufficiency, right? Uh, re Self-reflective. If now, let's say um, in an intimate relationship, you might, you will have shared responsibilities, right? Um, where you agree, okay, can you do this? Okay, will you do this? Yes, I will do this. And taking responsibility for it, right? Um, being able to, you know, where you can depend on them rather than saying, oh, you didn't remind me often enough. Um, I didn't think it was important. Oh, I can do it next week, right? So when that happens one or two times is okay. When that happens over and over again, then, um, you know, you need to worry. So the green flag there is, is this person dependable, right? Is this person responsible for themselves as well as the relationship um, as a whole, right? Uh, honoring boundaries, right? Uh, in, I have seen good relationships where the couple have come to me and said, you know, uh, I was very suspicious and um, I wanted to look at their phone, but I felt that it was really not the best thing to do right now what do we do okay but so even with great difficulty they are recognizing and honoring boundaries right um and, and that also displays empathy right that someone else's privacy their personal space is important that to violate that would um violate their trust will make them very vulnerable and so on. So these are um, the green flags that uh, I would encourage all of you to look out for, whether it is in an ongoing relationship or whether you are sort of dipping your toe into the waters for the first time. Yeah, that was a, that was a brilliant, actually, that the answer was, I mean, red flags, I mean, and thank you, Doctor, for actually pointing out the green flags as well. Because a lot of times the, the the spotlight is always just, I mean, you know, on the red flags. And a lot of times people they mistake, I mean, they they, they mistake a lot of you know, I mean, normal kind of characteristics for red flags, and they can't distinguish it properly. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and Doctor said, like, yeah, basically the disregard for boundaries, uh, withholding affection, lack of empathy, controlling nature that mm -hmm. person would have, and all those going red flags and green flags. I mean, basically loving a person regardless and not despite. So that truly was important. Understanding. So, doctor, uh, we are. Yeah, um, we've got time. Yeah. So, uh, the last fifteen minutes, uh, we're gonna uh, uh, get into the Q and A session. And we uh, in our chat, I don't think we have any questions in our chat, but we do have questions that we got from our. Uh, Form that we circulated the past few days, and uh, uh, one question is, doctor. So I'm gonna it, the the yeah the the participant will remain anonymous as mm -hmm. chosen to. Uh, so I quote, doctor. I feel so scared to get in in a relationship, to get into a relationship, as I'm afraid that the partner will change. I've seen a couple who had an affair for a long time and ended up in an unsuccessful marriage, like. I really want to have a loving partner throughout my life who will never change me. How can I be so sure that my future life will go well if I get into a relationship? And I want to know whether the education level of the two affects in this case as well. Can I? Okay. So um, just to make sure that I have uh, captured all the points. One is that they feel scared when they think of a relationship. Uh, they are worried about whether the partner would change and uh, whether education level plays a part. Exactly. Right. Okay. So being scared is normal. 
right? That's it's okay to feel scared. It's okay to feel worried. It's okay to give it a lot of thought. And sometimes at the end of those thoughts, you haven't got an answer. That's also okay, right? But maybe think, why do you feel scared? And I think uh, part of it is there in the question itself that you may have observed one or more relationships where there has been a breakdown, right? Um, later on, okay? Now, I cannot, I do not have a magic formula, right? To tell you how to find a partner who will not change. People change, you will change, your needs will change, right? Your priorities will change, okay? That is a fact of life, right? How you think in your 20s will be different to how you think in your 30s and your 40s and so on. What you value and prioritize, right, will change. Now, what is important is to find someone um, who um, there have been people who have done brilliantly uh, in uh, undergraduate education with the thought or with the plans of going into um, very competitive postgraduate programs who later decide that, um, look, this doesn't work for me, right? I do not want to go into uh, a more competitive program, but I would like to build my life um, as a general practitioner um, close to my village and so on. There may be uh, some people who start the relationship thinking, I want five children, right? Um, and then, after working uh, or after certain life experiences, they may think no, right? Um, maybe never or maybe a lesser number, right? The important thing is to find someone who you can discuss this with. And this discussion should be frequent, right? Not, not a tedious discussion, but you know, you touch base occasionally and say, okay, where are we going from here? What next? Right. Um, it it could be as as um, it could range from you know deciding whether you want a simple wedding or a lavish wedding. Are you on the same page when it comes to that? Are you on the same page when it comes to family life and children? Are you on the same page when it comes to sexual expectations? Right. Uh, are you on the same page when it comes to how you like to spend your free time? Some people are very active. They like to go camping and hiking and climbing mountains, while others would like to um, read a book somewhere, right? The important thing is that you accept and support the other person's choices, right? And there are wonderful couples who have different, um, different likes but still support each other and have built a really uh, good relationship, right? So for your question, how can you find someone who will not change? You cannot, right? And, but try to find someone who you can talk with through the change, right? And sometimes the change would be for the better and sometimes the change would be for the worse, right? There is, um, the red flags and the green flags would help you, but sometimes it's just not predictable, right? Um, but being able to talk through the change, what each other's expectations are, how those expectations need to be adjusted, all of that is very important. But take your time. That is why you need to take your time and get to know the other person. So our culture and context and so on, we tend to uh, think that friendships between, um, you know, men and women, casual friendships, just being friends with someone of the opposite sex, um, that's not good. It is either an intimate relationship or not, right? And uh, there's a lot of judgment from society. 
as well. So I would say still get to know the person because this is your life. This is your future. Even if it is a short-term relationship, even if it lasts one year, right? That is That year is precious to you, right? And so it's important to take your time and really find someone who can be a partner in the process. Exactly. And going back to what you said, a person, a partner who appreciates you for who you are and everything and appreciating someone for who they are means, I mean, that person changes, both change. So you have to take in those changes as well. And then touching base, going back, trying to assess where we are, what's the situation of the relationship, yes. how we're going to move forward. And so, yeah, and I think that was a really sufficient answer for that. And I hope that um, that was a good enough answer for the student. And so uh, another, I think, yeah, we, we can uh, go over another question. Um, uh, okay, uh, doctor, this question is, um, I quote, is it possible for a girl in Sri Lanka to live unmarried? What are the possible problems that would come along? Is it good or ethical to have a relationship without having hopes about a marriage? Or are we being unfair to the other person? And I think you kind of touched. Uh, mm -hmm. on the okay, so there are two aspects here. One is, is it okay uh, for a girl in our society to remain unmarried? And uh, the second thing is, is it okay to be in a casual relationship without uh, any uh, long-term commitments or uh, expectations of marriage, right? Um, absolutely, yes, it is uh, all right for a girl to remain unmarried, right? They do so uh, quite often. It is up to them. If you wish to remain unmarried, it is up to you. So what is important, important there is that you are able to be independent, right? You are financially independent, right? You have a good support network, right? And you um, are able to meet your needs for interpersonal support through other means, right? And so having good friendships, being in a stable job, right? Being confident, right? So there will be parental pressure. No matter how educated you are, there will be parental pressure. And for females, it will be you have to stay in your parents' home. If you are an unmarried female, then you live with your parents and you take care of the parents and the parental home. And more and more uh, women are saying no to this, that they want to be independent. And uh, quite often they will um, rent their own apartment uh, or, you know, shared accommodation with friends, right? Um, and uh, continue with their lives, right? Now the challenge comes from society, right? So on one hand, there will be uh, males, men, who think that uh, a single woman who is living by herself is easy game, right? They will, uh, just because you are not looking for a long-term relationship does not mean you're looking for a short-term relationship with every single person who says hi to you in your inbox, right? Okay, so, uh, and unfortunately, uh, some men and women do not understand the meaning of the word, no, I am not interested. Okay, so there will be that sort of challenges as well. And that comes with challenges of safety, right? How safe are you living by yourself, right? And these can be managed by living in shared accommodation or in an apartment complex or in a gated community where uh, there is security, right? Unfortunately, we live in a society and it's not exclusive to Sri Lanka, all over the world, right? Where a uh, woman has to be hyper vigilant, right? It doesn't matter whether they are married or unmarried or old or young. They have to be hyper vigilant about their physical safety, right? So that that challenge is still there, right? So the second part of the question is: Is it good or moral or ethical to be in casual relationships, right? Morality is something you have within yourself. 
I cannot tell you what is good or moral, right? Um, whether you're married or unmarried, you still have a need for intimacy. You still have a need for closeness, right? And sometimes you get that closeness through other relationships. Remember, we talked about intimacy um, as being part of relationships, close relationships um, in a broader sense. And sometimes you decide, no, I want it in an intimate partner relationship. Right? As long as both partners are on the same page, right? It is all right. Okay. Once again, there are challenges from society, right? Uh, there will be the uh, aunties next door, and uh, you know the co-workers who will be counting the number of uh, boyfriends or girlfriends. Um, and um, that is there, but as long as you the two people understand each other, I think um, their needs will be met and that's what we need to go for. It is not illegal, right? It is not uh, wrong in any way uh, to have a, a casual relationship. In fact, it is, it is less ethical to have uh, some sort of uh, extramarital relationship or uh, when there is cheating, but that is far more common in society than casual relationships. But it is the casual relationships that get spotlighted and um, judged. Yeah, yeah no, I think that is true. A lot of times students are bogged down by, on one hand, the traditional uh, ideologies that exist and coupled with that, with the vastly, I mean, they're greatly unexperienced and a lack of exposure. Couple all that together and, you know, it's it's true, these concerns arise, but I think you clarified it, Doctor, and uh, I hope that student who got sufficient answer. Um, it's it's really about, you know, casual relationships, it's fine, there's nothing wrong with that. And uh, I think you know, we have time for one more question. Uh, doctor, yeah, uh, I quote, how to get rid of traumatic experiences from the past. And I believe that this refers to possibly uh, maybe a student who suffered from a breakdown, something like that. And also how to deal, going along with how to deal with uh, having trust issues in another person. Okay. Right, so when you say traumatic issues from the past, um, I can think of several examples. One may be, personally experiencing a dysfunctional relationship in your home or in your family, right? Um, and that itself may create trust issues, right? Uh, it may be unsuccessful relationships in the past uh, where, um, you know, there have been terminations without any explanation, without, um, you know, without anything, suddenly you get dumped, right? Or it could be finding that there is a third party or a fourth party in the relationship without your knowledge, right? So all of these are actually deeply painful experiences, right? And, and I think we process it in different ways, but the truth is that they can be very painful, okay? So the first step, I think, is by just by recognizing that you have um, this painful or traumatic experience, right? And that it may affect how you approach future relationships. I think that itself is a big, big positive, um, uh, positive aspect, right? Because you have identified um, the problem or part of the problem, right? The second thing is to maybe get uh, professional help. Right, because like I said, especially if this trauma comes from childhood or early adulthood, you may not be able to process it yourself. And your friends or your peers may not be able to give you the support you need, right? So there is a little reluctance to go for uh, counseling or mentoring, um, but I think these services are being more and more um, they're more and more widely available, right, and accessible. 
um, they are available online right through video conferencing or with the uh, professional or uh, through telephone calls or um, even through chat messages right and and there are very well regulated services in other countries which provide text message based support right um to seek for, seek help and identify okay how do you go from here the next step would be to really think when you would be ready for the next relationship if you are not ready you are not ready don't let society pressure you into a relationship that you are not ready for do not let your friends pressure you into a relationship do not let the other party pressure you into a relationship that you are not ready for okay so your well being is very important right so be aware when do you feel ready and and you know sometimes you might feel okay i'm not fully ready but i'm ready to take the next step you you need not wait until you are 100% um you know okay because okay is very subjective but being aware of your own feelings and and your own needs and your own capacity is very important yeah no, it's there's no need to you know uh what do you call it bog it down on the water you can identify what you have and there are so many outlets that are available to get help to seek help and you know you can stop pause figure it out because life is about moving forwards and that has to be open. so um i think yeah that uh, our time is up and i think that uh, we uh covered yeah and i hope that was a an good on a good enough answer for the student um and so doctor uh, to simply just sum it up very briefly i mean uh, but you know before that doctor yeah uh, no okay so doctor yeah we talked about i mean uh, went into the what's and the hows and the do's and the don'ts and the why's and everything that has to do with an intimate relationship you know what an intimate relationship means and it's about understanding between two people connecting love trust respect that goes into it the red flags green flags not enough light gets you know put on the green flags but that was there as well and then you know all of those i think and along with that the mistakes that students make the traditional ideologies how you know the control that they have on students mentalities and um self awareness self awareness which is so important when uh, getting into a relationship along with really just assessing everything and trying to properly rather than you know getting making this decision and understanding what relationship means so important and i think uh that was brilliantly explained and uh brilliant illustrated by you doctor so thank you very much and uh uh in case i mean obviously in this hour we talked a lot discussed a lot but however uh students or anyone rather would have concerns uh, of more greater magnitude and they would would like to seek uh well you know help on a much let's say on large scale and so mm -hmm. uh, if you mind doctor are there any uh, sources or you know institutes that you could recommend yes absolutely and and that's thank you for bringing up that uh, point so um i understand uh, that you have in your faculty you have a uh, senior student counselor as well as student counselors uh, who are available to discuss um matters regarding not only regarding relationships but you can approach them uh, then you are mentored in groups and your mentor is also a point of contact right uh, there will be very very experienced very empathetic professionals um all of them all of uh, as well um in the department of psychiatry um of your faculty and the university itself will also have a senior counselor where you may be referred to if you want to speak to someone who is not uh, academic in your faculty if for some reason you feel that that is a necessity right and these uh, academics uh, can refer you to external sources of support should you 
need it. Now, the important thing here is that seeking support does not mean failure, right? It does not mean that your relationship has failed. Um, it is not something bad. This is, how, this is the stigma in our society, that if you go for marriage counseling, it means your marriage is dead. It's on the rocks. If you go for relationship counseling, that's the end of things. No, it, it is in fact a healthy step. It means that you have identified that there is a problem and you are taking measures to um, resolve that problem. And I think uh, it should be approached in that spirit. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, and uh, yeah, if I guess, yeah, that, that clearly puts it in perspective. So thank you so much. Uh, I know you're really busy amidst um, a lot of things and amidst a busy schedule. So thank you so much for finding this time to talk to us and enlightening us with regards to uh, relationships. And I believe this is such an important topic. So uh, thank you, doctor. And um, uh, and to end it, I guess, uh, our Dean Madam is present, uh, Professor Eva Vicente. Uh, Madam, if you, if you would mind, I mean, uh, to speak a few words regarding this. Uh... Good evening. I really enjoyed that talk. Took me back to the days when I was a medical school uh, student. Thank you, Ashwini. Thank you, Thank you for that Madam. very clear clarification of a lot of the questions that Abhishek put. And thank you, Abhishek, for conducting this uh, discussion forum very expertly, I might say. And thank you for all the students who participated. I think uh, Ashwini brought up several important points that you can reflect and think about. Um, I think that's only a very brief thing that we could discuss in this uh, one hour or so. There are a lot of ramifications, a lot of complications that Ashwini alluded to. Um, and each one's problem, each one's relationship will be different from another person's. Um, but <clears throat> those are the things that make life in undergraduate education interesting, I believe. Uh, so don't hesitate, go for it and uh, enjoy your undergraduate education. It's not all about studying the basic sciences. It's about forming relationships, enjoying your time here as well. So thank you very much, everybody. And I must say thank you to Professor Paranidharan and manager, uh, Dr. Manager Pereira, I think who was also instrumental in organizing this, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and yes, we can look forward to more uh, interesting discussions like this, which impact on the daily student life. So thank you and good, good night, everybody. Thank you, Madam. Uh, thank you so much, Madam. And uh, speaking to Professor Paranidharan, I believe uh, Professor also present. Uh, would you like to speak a few words? Um... No. <clears throat> oh, no. <clears throat> Sorry, thank you very much for giving me a chance. And again, I take this opportunity to thank uh, Dean, Madam, and Dr. Ashwini for agreeing to come and, uh, you know, sharing your experience with us, with all the students. Thank you very much and good night to all of you. Abhishek, you have done a wonderful job. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dean, Madam, and uh, thank you, Dr. Ashwini, again. Um, thank you, Monarch, Madam, Students Affairs Division, Our Media Society, and everyone who uh, uh, participated in our uh, series and uh, hope to see you all next month uh, we're bringing with another we're coming up with another episode and uh, thank you all good night thank you